Good morning, Cherokee Hills Christian Church. Whether you're here with us uh, in the room or online, I am your youth and worship pastor, Dustin Roberson. No? Uh, I'm your backup uh, music guy, Sam Pappas. No? All right. Well, anyway, I know the Robersons are with us online. Uh, we, uh, they're quarantining today, so uh, we, I get to fill in. So it'll be a blessing to me anyway. All right. Let's all stand together and we'll raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a Oh! 
Good morning, everybody. It is a Sunday morning, and you are exactly at the place that God wants you to be at today, here, which I'm glad you're here. All of you are here, and that's great. We are going to do a great worship service, but I want to start out by just reading a passage of Scripture from Psalm 27. It says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me upon a rock. This was written by David in a tough time in his life at the time. We have several people in our church, actually, that right now are going through tough times. Loss of loved ones. One, a couple of mothers that have died and another one that's a man that's died. And they're all connected here. But I want you to see and understand that when God shows up in your heart and in your, your life, he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high on a rock. That's for you today and for God's love for you to shower out during this worship service. So let me pray, and then we'll continue on. Father God, we thank you for the promises that we have in Christ. And we're so thankful that that goes all the way back to the Old Testament, to the life of David and Abraham and all kinds of other people. The focus of our worship and the focus of our heart is you. It's not the circumstances around us right now. It's not the good and the bad. The focus is you. And we give this to you today and hope that it, through the process of what we're doing in our life that we can always be proud to say we worship God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing about our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense so i won't be going under i'm not held by my own strength because i built my life on jesus he's never let me down he's faithful in every season so why would he he won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. He 
Thank you. 
Please have a seat. So as we prepare to take communion together, I'd like to just read you a story, if I could, out of the book of Mark. It says, it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who were coming down to destroy the temple and build it again in three days, come down from the cross and save yourselves. In the same way, the chief priest and the teachers of the law mocked him. 
He saved others, they said, but can he save himself? Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, let him come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, so if you remember, he went up at 9 o'clock in the morning. So at noon, he had been there for three hours already. Darkness came over the whole land until 3 in the afternoon. Another three hours. So he's been there six hours in, his, in excruciating pain. At 3 in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to take him down, they said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, He said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, The body was given to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of it against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who's going to roll the stone away for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. That's exactly what we are celebrating as we take communion today. We just sang about it. We just read about it. The cup that we're taking represents the blood that he shed for us. The bread that we take represents his body that was broken for us. And today we get to celebrate the fact that not only did he die on the cross for us, but he was buried and then he rose from the dead. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much. God, we thank you for Jesus. We've spent the entire morning singing about him. God, we take this time of communion to celebrate him. It's because of him that we have the ability to spend eternity with you, and we are forever grateful. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Part of our worship time is giving, and we've 
you've seen the boxes at the doors as you come in, you can you can give in that way. We'll have some guys standing at the back here if you would like to uh, to give your offering in that way, or whether you give online or use the QR code or however you do. Uh, we want generosity to, to be part of your worship. Here's my heart. Here's my heart. Oh. Here's my heart. Oh. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Sing that again. Here's my. Father, you are light, you are light. 
life, you are true. And so, God, as we come to this time when we're going to hear from your word, um, God, I pray that your word sinks deep into our hearts, that you keep our, your word at the forefront of our minds, that as we go through life, we're always thinking of your word, dwelling on your word, and in our interactions with one another, uh, blessing one another with your word. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Our kids are ready to go to Brook, so head that way. Thank you, guys. We are so blessed, aren't we, to have people that can step in on short notice and to be able to lead us in worship and to be able to uh, uh, just roll with it, right? And uh, aren't you thankful for this group up here? I know I am too. Thank you to Mark and the group. And um, I, we were going to just let it go without being said, but I'll also say our group that's back in the sound area, the tech guys are amazing too. Uh, they had a lot of things they were working through today. It wasn't that long ago that we weren't sure if there was going to be anything on the screens for you guys, but great job, everybody. Uh, team effort back there. We're so glad to uh, have a great group that's here and so glad to have you here today. Uh, what a blessing it is to be able to worship together, to be able to study God's word, and to encourage each other in our faith. Well, it was in sixth period math class when Mr. Lawson's classroom uh, had a student named Jack Bienvenu. And he had this, what he called a premonition. He remembers it was exactly 2.15 in the afternoon on March the 21st when his life completely changed. See, Bienvenu uh, was an 18-year-old who graduated from Cape Cod Technical High School in Harwich, Massachusetts, and he had seen his beloved Boston Celtics climb from the basement of the Eastern Conference all the way up to fourth place. Mark, where are you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and whenever his friends started arguing who was going to win the title for the NBA, he didn't understand what there was to debate about. And so he said, I'm so confident that the Celtics will win that he said, I'll get a tattoo of the title banner on my arm. So here's a picture of Jack being venue. And uh, he got this tattoo on his arm, 2022 world champion Boston Celtics. And so he went ahead and put that on there. They said, no, you won't. And he said, yes, I'm going to do it. Well, those of you that follow the NBA uh, know that the Celtics actually did make it to the finals. And maybe it was going to work, but they ended up losing 4-2 to two to the Golden State Warriors. And uh, Bienvenu said that he is going to keep the tattoo in hopes that they win it next year. And instead of taking the whole thing off, he only has to change the 2 to a 3. All right? So that's, that's pretty smart for him. He says, if it works, I'm a prophet. That's what Jack said. Now, I have heard that with a little encouragement, the rumor is, is that Mark Ediger would get the same tattoo as well. So just... Um, <laughs> work on that, <laughs> right? He said, if it works, I'm a prophet. And I think he sounds a little bit more like an eternal optimist, doesn't he? Well, I had a prediction of my own this past week. I was talking to Cassie as the NFL season's about to start, and I told her I had a prediction about uh, the Dallas Cowboys, and that was that, um, not that they were going to win the title. I didn't say that. I said, actually, that they were going to fire their coach midseason and try to prepare to hire Sean Payton. Anybody else agree with that? Okay. I think it's going to happen. It's really not that great of a prediction because um, the Cowboys are the, like, the most penalized team in the NFL, and I think they're going to lose a couple of games, and they're just going to get tired of the guy and say, see you later. All right? So that's not a great prediction because people see it coming, right? A prediction is not that great if you see it coming. Now, the Boston Celtics winning the title when you're in fourth place, that's a little bit more. But as we look into the pages of Scripture and think a little bit about what prophecy looks like, you know, Jack uh, from Massachusetts said he was a prophet, but prophecy, truly what does it look like in the pages of Scripture? A true prophetic statement from biblical standards would be less that a certain team would win this year and more like something like this. Like a thousand years ago, we would predict that sports like basketball and football even exist in the first place, right? A thousand years. That's wild. 
then we would have to describe how and who would win that game that doesn't even exist yet. Do you see how much of a stretch it is? Think about that for just a moment. We have prophecies in the Old Testament, in the first section of your Bible, that between the major and minor prophets, the Psalms, which we've been studying over the last several weeks, and a few other scattered places, point to Jesus as the Messiah, that were written between 500 and 1,000 years ago. And they were all written that many years, no, not a year, years ago, but before he was even born. And so we look at these seven major prophecies about the Messiah that are written in the Old Testament. We, again, span between 500 and 1,000 years before Jesus was even born. And as you think about that, you think about some of the minor prophets like Zechariah 500 years before, Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was even born, and the Psalms, which we've been studying, 1,000 years before he was even born. So here's a few of them. Micah 5.2, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. We know that well. Malachi 3.1, he would be preceded by a forerunner, and we know that to be John the Baptist. Zechariah 9.9, 9, that he would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Zechariah 13.6, that he would be betrayed by a friend, which would result in his hands being wounded. Judas. Again, pointing to Judas, Zechariah 11, 12 and 13 says that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, which would be given to a potter. Isaiah 53, 7, that he would stand silent before his oppressors, and Psalm 22, 16, that he would die by crucifixion. Amazing, major prophecies about the Messiah, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus even walked the face of this earth. Now, Peter Stoner wrote in his book, Science Speaks, he, he calculated the probability of these passages being fulfilled in one person to be uh, one in 100 quadrillion Okay, that's 1 in 10 to the 17th power, if you count the zeros, 17 of them, all right? And as you think about that truth, that's, it's hard to comprehend 100 uh, quadrillion. It's such a large number, but to put it in perspective, Stoner calculated this number, and you've probably heard this before, to be equivalent to covering the state of Texas. The state of Texas, two feet deep in silver dollars. And if we painted one of those silver dollars red and we asked a blindfolded vagabond to wander through the state of texas and randomly stoop down just once just once and pick up a coin the odds of picking the red one are the same as the odds of jesus randomly fulfilling these seven prophecies are you starting to get the idea this is this is crazy this is out there this is not anything that could be matched by any odds that we could understand and yet jesus didn't fulfill seven he fulfilled another 50 major prophecies on top of the seven and dozens of minor references throughout the old testament and so as we think about that we come to our psalm series and we've been talking about playlists for life and the idea that there's a song in scripture for every mood every season that you may go through and as you think about the seasons of life that you've gone through every mood every season you might think of sunny days you might think of rainy days you might think of the journey that you've been on in a road trip or seasons of disorder or maybe seasons of order. And in all of that, God is there through them all. And he's reigning as king, isn't he? Today, we wrap up this series reminding you that all of these psalms, no matter what the season, no matter what the mood, all of these psalms point to Jesus. Every single one of them, each psalm anticipates Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah who came once to save and will come again to usher us into eternity with him. He is our king. You know, you can uh, ask different people about what Jesus' last name was, and it's not Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's actually a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. And Jesus' last name, uh, instead of being Christ, it's, it's the description it's his title. It means anointed one. It's roughly the equivalent to the, the term king. But like whenever David called Saul, remember the Lord's anointed one? We've been studying that on Wednesday nights the last several weeks. And yet the truth is here that there is a, a Messiah, the one that everyone was waiting for. And as the Psalms look at that, they add to those major prophecies with predictions that this Messiah in the book of Psalms would be from the seed or the line of David that he would be raised from the dead, that he would be crucified, that he would be betrayed by a friend, among a lot of other things. And so we want to take a look at a few of those today 
But first, as we do that, let's look at some of Jesus' own words just to confirm that he wasn't saying that they'd gotten anything mixed up. This is Jesus' words. In fact, in Acts 1-3, it says that after his suffering, Jesus present, presented himself to them, his followers, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And so here's Jesus after his resurrection and before his ascension again, and he spends time. Why, uh, why does he spend time with them? Because he wants to talk to them about the kingdom of God. He wants to give them proofs so that they can connect the dots and see that he was the one that they were waiting for. And as the light bulb came on for them, Luke chapter 24, verse 27, reminds us of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with these two that were trying to figure everything out. They were trying to understand what had just happened, what had transpired over the days previous. And as he was talking to them, it says that in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And so he started to uh, just unpack, make connections for these people so that they could see that, yes, all the things that we've experienced and all the things that we've seen are for a purpose, and it was to point to Jesus as the anointed one. If you fast forward just a little bit further in Luke uh, 24, Jesus is with all of his disciples, and it says that he said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, what we've been studying. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And he said, you're witnesses of these things. You're witnesses of these things, and I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high, the promised Holy Spirit. And so as he encourages them with these words, it's again this light bulb moment. He opened their minds, the scripture says. He opened their minds to be able to connect the dots to the law and the prophets and the Psalms, which basically was saying the entire Old Testament, everything that you've studied, everything that I've taught you, everything that you've known points to me in this moment. And Jesus is the, un, is the key to unlock the mystery of the entire Old Testament. And so today, we read through the Old Testament with Jesus in mind. We read through the Old Testament knowing that there's something greater that is to come. And it changes the way we look at it all, doesn't it? It changes everything. And so as we think about these Messianic Psalms, today, as we finish this series in the playlist for life, we look at these Messianic Psalms. These Psalms that look at Jesus a thousand years before he was ever even born. And these psalms we know to be of Jesus for several things. We have to look at, as we interpret them, number one, as the way that they were used in the Old Testament. We have to recognize that they did have a, a contextual, historical purpose at that time. But then they also looked forward to the, to the greater future and, and sometimes even were referred to in the New Testament back by Jesus or of Jesus. And so we want to look at a few of them and see that the Messianic psalms point to Jesus Number one, as God's son. They point to Jesus as God's son. We're going to start in Psalm uh, chapter 2. And the second psalm uh, we look at, Charlie shared with us a few weeks ago, Psalm 1. And we saw how the whole book of songs was, was written and started out just take, uh, encouraging us to take delight in the word of the Lord. And as Charlie encouraged us to do that, be like that tree that's planted by streams of living water. But then in the second psalm, it says this, why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time in futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now it goes on in verse 7 to say that the king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son today. I have become your father. And then I'm going to skip to verse 9. It says, you will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. These are the three sections of Psalm 2 that are used in the New Testament referring to Jesus. And so as you think about those sections, that first section in verses 1 and 2 refer to Jesus' trials. And it talks about these kingdoms, these rulers, these players in the drama of Jesus' suffering. And in the New Testament, we see that it's pointing back to all those who would put Jesus on trial, those who would feel threatened by his coming, by the idea that he would be king. 
And as they saw all those things, that they would put him not only to trial, but they would uh, make him suffer uh, in their insecurity. And so they plotted against him, and we see that in verses 1 and 2. And then in verse 7, God uh, used this several times to point to Jesus' identity. Now, I want to remind you today that God spoke audibly in the Old Testament several times, but in the New Testament, he only speaks audibly three times, other than through Jesus. And in those three times that God speaks audibly, twice, two of the three of those, he paraphrased this verse talking about Jesus uh, being his son. You might remember that in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Holy Spirit comes and affirms Jesus' identity. He comes whenever Jesus is being baptized and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove, confirming and affirming Jesus' um, identity and God's declaration is of him being the Son. And then if you skip to Matthew chapter 17, it's in the middle of Jesus' ministry. And this fantastic event happens whenever Jesus was transfigured in the presence of Moses and Elijah and some of Jesus' closest friends were able to just see something is different about this Jesus. God once again affirmed Jesus' identity by saying, this is my son in whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. Listen to what he says. And so here we see Jesus as being the son of God. And we're, we're familiar with that idea as Jesus being the son of God. And yet, in this moment, it was something that we were reminded that even a thousand years before, that would be his title, that would be his identity. God confirmed it. Then in verse 9, we see this verse, or an image of it, used three times in the book of Revelation, that describes Jesus' regal rule. The fact that he would return in power, and if you look at the, the, the language of that verse, you'll see that whenever Jesus comes back, it won't necessarily be as the gentle shepherd. He will come as conquering king. And so, church, let's be ready for that. So the psalms remind us, these messianic psalms remind us that Jesus is affirmed as God's son. But the second one that we're going to look at today is that it affirms Jesus as David's Adonai. We're going to look at that in Psalm 110. And in Psalm 110, we see some more images of the coming king in Jesus, the Messiah. In Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. You will rule over your enemies. Verse 4, The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And these are images which would look to Jesus as David's Adonai. Now, what does that mean? We, we find the connection of being David's Adonai, and we'll explore that a little bit more, but let's first look at it in the context of Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, it says that while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? What do you think about this guy, this Messiah that's supposed to come, this anointed one that's supposed to come? Who is he? And so he asked those religious people who was the Messiah to be. They said, where was he going to come from? And so they answered, Who's, whose son is he? Well, he is the son of David, they replied. And he said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, in other words, being inspired, David being inspired, how is it that he calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then Jesus goes on, if then David calls him Lord, then how can he be his son? And so no one could say a word in reply. Verse 46 says, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> that shut him up pretty good, right? Is anybody else a little bit confused? Well, yeah, it was like a riddle, wasn't it? Jesus was actually coming to them with a riddle. I read one this past week that's very similar. So see if your minds are awake yet this morning, if you've had enough coffee. Uh, two fathers and two sons sat down to eat eggs for breakfast. They ate exactly three eggs. Each person had an egg. The riddle is for you to explain how. Okay? Two fathers, two sons sat down to eat eggs for breakfast. They ate exactly three eggs, and each person had an egg, one egg. Right? So the answer is this. Have you figured it out? The answer is this. One of the fathers is also a grandfather. <laughs> okay? And therefore, the other father is both a son and a father to the grandson. Okay, so you've got, you've got the three that are there and eating one egg apiece. And it's as if Jesus tells a riddle like that. He's saying, wait a minute, if this Messiah is supposed to be the son of David, 
then how in the world could he be Lord? See, whenever we think about this, the royal line, then we are reminded that the, the Father is always greater than the Son. The Father is always greater than the Son. And, and of course, Jesus knew that the people that he was speaking to would know this very well. And so as he thinks about that for just a moment, then he, he asks them to ask this question, how in the world could the Son be the Lord of his forefather? Well, let's look a little bit more closely, maybe your scriptures, whenever you look at Psalm 110 or even Matthew 22, verse 44, it says, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, you might notice something, and several of you already know this, that if you are reading an English translation in your Bible, whenever it uses the word Lord, there's a couple different variations of that. If you read it and it's in all caps, then you're really talking about Yahweh, the one true God, Jehovah, the King uh, of the Israelites, the, the one that we know of from Scripture. And yet, if you see the one that is capital L and then lowercase O-R-D, then you'll know that that's more of the word Adonai, the one that means also uh, a reference for God, a lord, a master, or even could be used in some certain situations as a human dignitary, like a human king. And so as Jesus is asking them this question, then he's saying this, yes, you know that David came first, and if the father is always greater than the son then the Messiah being his Lord, how is that even possible? And they were quiet because this riddle they didn't understand, and yet it's something that they knew very well from Scripture, and he challenges them in their thinking. And so as he, do, does, as he does this, he, he calls them into account that they had no category for what we would call an incarnation. That means God becoming man. And if in their mind they can't understand that God would become human, then this is nonsense to them. But God becoming human makes it all fall into place. And we know that to be true from the word of God, don't we? Jesus, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, here with us. And as Jesus, God in the flesh, comes down to be among his creation, then we know that this is only possible because Jesus is the one. He is the Messiah. And if that's true, and it changes everything. In fact, whenever we come to the scripture that it says that he will uh, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet, then we recognize that this is a position of divine power. And we see from the pages of the New Testament that Jesus is always in the place of divine power after the asc ascension, and he's there today. And so whenever we sing to him, cornerstone and Christ alone, my firm foundation, then we know that Jesus is the one seated at the right hand of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. The scripture goes on to talk about the priest forever and the in order of Melchizedek. That's a different sermon for a different time. But the metaphor is for the Messiah because he had his role both as king and priest. Now, Peter used this verse in his famous sermon at Pentecost. Do you remember whenever Jesus had ascended into heaven? The Holy Spirit came into that place, and Peter uh, and, and the rest of the apostles started speaking in the languages of all the people that were gathered there. They realized there was something going on here that was bigger, some God event that had taken place. And in that moment, Peter gets up to share the gospel message for the first time connecting all those dots. And as he does that, he, he references the scripture. And as he shares that, he, he preaches about Jesus being the one that they had looked to. God, he says, God made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. It was proof. And in that place, you might remember exactly what happened. People responded to the gospel. They said, brothers, what should we do? And people came and started giving their lives to God. And really in the first Christian sermon where we see Jesus being proclaimed as the Messiah, as the one that we would have save us, Paul used this description three times in his writing, and no other individual fits the description of God's son and David's Adonai. And so we see those two truths, but also this powerful one today. I appreciate Ken mentioning uh, this in our communion time because we're reminded that Jesus was not just the Messiah. He was the one that died for our sins, yes, but he was the one that was resurrected. Don't you love it whenever we're singing about the resurrection? And it just feels like there's just this crescendo that comes up of excitement because we recognize that we have hope. God is so good through the resurrection of Jesus. 
So in Psalm 16, we see that a thousand years before Jesus was ever even uh, walking the face of this earth. And in Psalm 16, he says, No wonder my heart is glad, verse 9, and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. And maybe your scripture says to let the Holy One see decay. And in that moment, we look and we see that Jesus was one who was going to be down for a time, but he wasn't out. He is the resurrected one, the one who would uh, come back in a way that no other leader, no other ruler ever could. In the way that no other um, one that we could follow would be able to triumph over death. And so in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 31, we see part of this sermon that Peter preached. And we see this reference to Psalm 16. A thousand years prior, whenever he was referring to that, saying that David said about him, Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is what they were destined for. Um, and um, I saw the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence. And so he turns to the crowd and he says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that this patriarch David died, and he was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. You can see it. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an, on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne, seeing what was to come. He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. And so Peter, in this sermon, preaches the truth, that they knew, da they knew David, and they knew the background, and yet his tomb was there to that day, and yet Jesus was alive. Oh, he is the risen one. The one that we celebrate not just at Easter, but the one who reigns today at the right hand of God. The one that because he conquered death is going to conquer death in all of us as well. The death is not the end of the story. It does not have the last word. And so Jesus is God's son. The Psalms tell us that. He is David's Adonai. He is the risen one. But finally, he is also the cornerstone. The cornerstone. And so we look at Psalm 18, 118. And in Psalm 118, we see images of this cornerstone. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And so we see this blessing um, the one who comes in the name of the Lord and Jesus' triumphal entry. But in addition to that, we, we see that he is the one who is the cornerstone. The stone that the builders had rejected has become the cornerstone. We know this is said of Jesus as the cornerstone. Why? Because Jesus himself referred to that. Matthew chapter 21, he says this. Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And after Jesus had told this parable and made this connection with the cornerstone, then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard that, and he knew that he was talking about them and indicting them. And he looked for a way to arrest them. And it says that they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And so for political reasons, they let him go. We see Jesus as the cornerstone. The firm foundation that we are built upon, this rock, that you can count on, that you can trust, but that everything is built on, around, and pointing to. And so as we think about that truth in our life, we see 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, that makes the connection to us. Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God 
through Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is, is that we, a family of God, come together being built upon this foundation and we rise together to be this holy temple. This place of love, this place of security, this place where Christ is proclaimed. And as we do that, we announce to everyone else that Jesus is the one that it's all built on. We come together in strength because we are built on the foundation of Jesus. For it says in verse 6 in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So the truth is, is that as we come to Jesus, our lives can either be built upon him or we can be tripped up by that truth. It all comes back to Jesus. And the same is true today. You can build your life on so many different things. We know that even through his parables that you can build your life on something that's not going to stand and not going to last like the sand or you can build your life on something that's, that's going to be there. And Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, is the only one to build your life upon. He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And so we, we, we proclaim that today in this place. If you don't hear anything else today, you may be completely bored by looking at these things in the Old Testament, bored by me, but the truth is, see Jesus. Hear Jesus. Know that he's the cornerstone to build your life on. And as you do that, would you grow together in this place as a temple of God that would point to him, that would point the world to him, that we would live lives so different from everyone else that people would see Jesus in us. I love the way that John finished his gospel. And I love how John in his writings a lot of times would, would tell you his purpose for writing. And over and over again, he said this, I tell you all these things so that you'll believe. John says in his gospel, that's exactly why he shared the truth of Jesus. He said that these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life in the power of his name. Do you believe today? I know that a lot of us come into this place knowing the truth of Jesus and who he is. And the reason that we share this from the Old Testament is just to give you encouragement that this isn't something that's contrived, it's not something that's made up, but this is something that's standing, it's sure. It's something that you can believe in and depend upon. It's something that you know to be true. Do you ever struggle with doubt? I know that in the times of my life, whenever I've wrestled, saying, God, is this all real? Is this all true? And the things that I come back to are the historical Jesus, the truth that we know that he not only lived on this earth, but we can go back to those places. I know that whenever I struggle with those things in my faith, I go back to the eyewitness accounts that have never been disproven. I go back to the empty tomb that his body was never found. I go back to those things that I can count on. But then, and even in addition to that, my faith is encouraged and it's strengthened by the fact that this isn't just a historical thing that happened, but it's something that God had been planning from the very beginning and that he pointed to all throughout history to say Jesus is the one that you're waiting for the first time, but he's the one that we wait on again to come and make everything right. Last week we talked about these judgment psalms, saying that there is a righteous anger that happens, and yet Jesus was the one who fulfilled all those things. Aren't you glad that there's good news at the end of it all? Jesus, in your belief, may people see him in us. May we point to him. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, but in your hearts, revere or set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do you have hope? Church, do you have hope? Is there a smile on your face whenever you leave this building? Is there joy in your heart whenever you go to work on a Monday morning, even though it's a Monday morning and you haven't had your coffee yet? Church, do you have hope? Well, this scripture says that if we show that, then people are going to ask us why. And we're going to point them to one, Jesus. We're going to point to the same one that David pointed to. We're going to point to the same one that Isaiah pointed to. We're going to point to the one 
who is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Messiah. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Christ alone, cornerstone. We're going to sing that here in a minute. The solid rock, the Lord of all. As we've gone through this playlist series, we've looked at sunny days, and on those days, I want to remind you that Jesus is worthy to be praised. But yet on the rainy days, Jesus listens. He understands what you're going through. On the road trips and when you're on a journey that seems long and winding and wears you out, Jesus walks with you. In the days of disorder, he is the order. In the bad days, Jesus remind us, reminds us that he's coming again. And let me tell you today, Jesus is enough. From A to Z, completely, he is enough. That's my king. Amen? All of scripture points to him as Savior and Lord. He's worthy of everything, our lives and all of us. So give your life to Jesus today. There was a missionary years ago named Jim Elliott, and he was this American Christian missionary and one of five people that were killed during Operation Aka. And in an attempt to evangelize the Aka people in Ecuador, uh, he uh, gave up his life, gave everything. And if you go back at some, and look at some of Jim Elliott's writings, he, he re even wrote in a journal a little bit about uh, the process that he went through and hearing God call him to do such a work as this. And in those journals, he prayed this prayer. Father, make me of me a crisis man. Make of me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to a decision. Let me not just be a milepost upon a single road, but make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. Could that be your prayer today? God, make me a crisis man. Bring those that I come into contact with to a point of decision. Not just a milepost on a single road, but make me, Lord, this fork so that the way I live my life causes people to turn one way or another because they see Jesus people see Jesus in you all of scripture points to him let's do the same God we thank you so much that Jesus is worthy of our worship we thank you so much that he is the Messiah the one that was long awaited from years before God it was your plan from the very beginning Lord it was your plan from even in the moment in the garden Lord whenever mankind fell and gave in to the temptation the first time. And Lord, we see Jesus as the one that you were pointing to all along to make things right again. God, you have created so many beautiful things and sometimes we've been able to see it and appreciate it and other times we've made a mess of it. But God, we thank you, uh, Lord, that you have made a way. God, we thank you for Jesus. We pray that we might be a people that not only trust him and believe in him, but point others to him as well. Lord, that they may have hope, that they may have life. Lord, we thank you for him, the cornerstone of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, we want you to know Jesus. It was such a thrill last week to uh, see Cody come and give his life uh, to Jesus, to be united in his baptism and his death, burial, and resurrection. What a great opportunity to be able to witness that your spiritual birthday Cody what a great day and yet at the same time the hope that Cody now has because of Jesus is the hope that you have in the middle of loss Charlie talked about that just a little bit ago and and Bobby losing your mom and and others of you that have gone through difficult days we have hope why because of Jesus so my encouragement to you today is don't leave this place not knowing Jesus not putting your trust in him if that's a decision you need to make today, we invite you to come. Maybe you just want to be a part of this temple that is built upon that foundation. We're not a perfect church. I know I'm not perfect, but we serve the one who is. And we'd love to have you be a part of this place that proclaims and points to Jesus. That's what we want to be about. So we invite you to come. If you want to make this church your home, join us in membership. Maybe if you just want prayer, we invite you to come. You can come over to this side and we'll just le let you pray. And we'll ask God to, to help you and be with you. If you want to come over here and pray with one of our leaders, then we invite you to do that. But we're going to sing this and give praise to Jesus as our cornerstone. And so I hope that in this moment, you'll just say thank you 
Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for our Messiah, the anointed one who was promised long ago. Would you stand? Let's worship. If you have a decision, you can. Sing that again.
great message this morning from Jared, and I hope it speaks to your heart as well. Um, just a couple announcements that I want to get out to you. One is tonight at 6 p.m. We'll have hymn night is what we're calling it. Uh, I call it ice cream float night. <laughs> that maybe is maybe not exactly uh, what I should say, but 6 o'clock, come and we'll celebrate God and Jesus in this way. The Travelers are going to Marlow Mercantile on September 16th. There'll be an Italian lunch and mercantile shopping. Um, I th probably we're paying for our lunch, uh, but you can sign up in the Connection Cafe back over here, and uh, you'll get some directions then about when we're leaving and, and what time and all of that. And then the other thing that's coming up, which I'm really excited about, is on September 18th, when we will have a ministry fair here at Cherokee Hills. I love the idea. I think it'll be great. You're going to see that we've established leadership teams for all these ministries. Now we're looking for people to work together with other people in the middle of all of that. And so that's going to be on the 18th. It'll be a completely different kind of service. That's going to really be focused on ministry fair, which means ministry that God's church is involved in as well. So you want to be here on the 18th and don't, don't skip that day because this is going to be priceless in many ways for our church as well. Okay? Why don't you stand if you would, please? Got another week coming ahead of us, so let's pray and ask God to bless that. We pray, God, that you would keep your hand on each one of us and that you would remind us over and over that you're there, that you're traveling the roads that we're traveling, that you know what is up and what is down with us in our life. And God, I pray that we would always be overwhelmed by your compassion, by your mercy, and by your love, which is eternal and forever. We pray, God, that you'd use us to reach other people to Christ, to set, set, spread a message that says Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He alone. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be dismissed. Thank mm -hmm. you.